Welcome, uh, Pathfinders and Wildcards, to an exciting evening with James Jacob. We are lucky to be uh, joined by the creative director of Paizo. Um, that's like very head head honcho, Grand Puba. I mean, what a great, great, great title. There's, there's very few uh, positions in the industry that are as cool as creative director, and you have snagged one. So congratulations, and thank you thank for giving us our time. Thanks. Yeah. It's fun to be here. So we do have some gremlins in the works. So every occasionally there's, there's an echo, or um, if James happens to drop a heavy book, we might lose the camera for a second. <laughs> but, yeah, I gotta be very still, or the, the gremlin like, he moved, he moved, get him. Right, but if you're too still, we can't tell if your camera is still operational. So you know. It's, oh, I, could, I just used like a JPEG or something and like did a record recording and gone home early. <laughs> right, exactly. I'll just talk to the JPEGs. <laughs> yeah. That's all we need. The, um, so we should be live on um, Peg Inc. and Paizo, official Paizo. So thank you for Paizo for letting us um, raid your stream as well. And um, so tonight's conversation is all about the epic, amazing, uh, groundbreaking Curse of the Crimson Throne adventure path. And uh, this is the 15th anniversary of the original release. Ooh. And then six years since we've had your amazing update with the hardcover and the extra content. So... Uh, I, I, I think in honor of that, we're, I, I, let me read the blurb so people know. I mean, it's, it's a great blurb. But the, uh, so this is what Pathfinder Curse of the Crimson Throne is all about. Um, the king is dead. In the uh, Verisian port city of Corvosa, the death of a monarch leads to chaos, and only the PCs can hope to save the city from its own darkest tendency. As the rule of the young queen grows more and more draconian, it's up to a band of bold adventurers to stop the spread of tyranny before all of Corvosa is crushed beneath her iron fist. In the Curse of the Crimson Throne adventure path, the heroes delve into the depth of urban adventure in order to stop riots, combat plague, root out organized crime. Like, I can't believe this is 15 years ago. This is very topical. Um, <laughs> and rescue political prisoners before escaping into the harsh badlands of the Stormall Plateau, where only the friendship of the barbaric Shoanti and a weapon drawn from the heart of a gothic castle can give them the strength to return and depose the evil queen once and for all. Uh, truly epic. Um, truly wonderful. I'm so glad that we, uh, you have allowed uh, Savage Worlds to play in this world, to convert it to Savage Worlds for our mm -hmm. fans. And um, so it's pretty exciting. So thank you for joining us. And uh, we've got some pre-questions. So guys, um, throw your comments in the chat and we'll get to those in order. But the, um, the first one we got pre-show was, what challenge, let's see, let me find it here. I can actually throw these up. Uh, is my audio a little low? So people complain my audio is too high. So let's see if I can't get a little more audio. Okay. The um, here's our very first question. What challenges did your team face while building a campaign where you present this big bad? I mean, it's right there in the blurb, right? You know, the Queen's going a little mad um, right up front, but then have players not go after them directly right away. That's a definitely a challenge, something that we wanted to do with Curse of the Crimson Throne Dark because the, uh, the team was working on, on it, myself and James Sutter and Wes Schneider. We'd, we'd been working, and Eric Mona, of course, is a publisher. Uh, we'd just finished up Rise of the Rise of the Rooms, and before that, back with the uh, Magazine, and Dean had done Tide and, and Age of Arms and Shackled, Shackled City. All of those, those big bad end guy is somebody that kind of gets put, pushed back to the last, you know, last encounter. And um, it was something that, a lot of people people gave us really good good feedback. It's like we, we want to know who these people are that we're fighting is fighting is before we get to the end of the entire story. And, and Curse of the Crimson Throne, that uh, having it be, be basic archetype of the or the evil queen, uh, let us start out right away. Boy, because she's right right there on screen, and you don't ne necessarily know what the, there, there's going to be spoilers. By the way, uh, for this adventure path plot line, as as we, as we throw, try to minimize minimize them, but but um. When the adventure path starts out, you don't really know that she's going to be the main, main villain of the entire thing. And um, um, so, in fact, uh, she's, one, she's one of the first that gives you, like, your one of your early quests to go, you know, check out thing. And and um, it's as you start playing playing through the adventure path, by the end of the first part, uh, you know that she's no good. But uh, but uh, there's a little bit of a, a, a window there where you can play around. around with and uh, I think really... One of the ways that we've man managed to avoid the 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 uh, end of like player characters trying to attack her early on is just the way we present the storyline. There's always something more important to do, you know you know whether like uh, uh, stopping, stopping this, this disease from spreading or you know you know deal with these the, these um uh, civic us and stuff like that. 
and and uh, having these scenes where the queen shows up goes up to more cinematic scenes rather than combat scenes. scenes. Um, um, if we this with the the new edition of uh, Path- Pathfinder, they've been resolved with downtime events or, or exploration uh, events. We didn't have that into the game back in first edition Pathfinder, so we kind of made it up as we want. We want these cinematic, not not read aloud text that you just because because you, you don't the scene where the GM GM is just read text. You want you want to have some interaction going on and these cinematic events where you see the queen do do, and you don't quite quite get the chance to oppose her immediately. Help helps to prevent the player characters from getting beat up. Well, right. I mean, this is a six book adventure path, right? So there is a lot of material, a lot of adventures. Yeah, you get yeah. to run around um, Galarian. Uh, Corvos is a big, big central piece, but you do get you know, get out of the city too. And um, the uh, I, I, I love how I mean how complex actually the, the, the design process must be of getting you know six different books that each kind of have to have their own highs and lows. And then kind of combine them into an overall adventure path that itself has the kind of the, the steady build and the expects the characters to be you know, going up in level um, you know, during each book. So the um, why don't you give some insight into like how, how do you balance six books and then did you know, kind of as an editor in chief make sure that you're hitting the right notes and then you do get the big payoffs you know, within each book and then at the end. It, it's I mean. The first thing we do when, when we're starting an adventure path is is, is whoever's, in, whoever's in charge of developer lead for that entire pro, uh, product has has to outline the entire thing. thing. So it's, it's you know we'll toss around cons and and, and um, work with other empl- employees you know to 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 brainstorm ideas and stuff like that. But in the end, it's one person in this case um, myself uh, has down and based and, and write out the entire outline. And the outlines are very detailed. They end up be, being, uh, for a six-part adventure path, they're usually, usually around 20,000 words long, which if published, it would, it would be maybe a 30-page adventure. So you know, it's, it's a significant length of words. Uh, has to cover all the parts and, and, and all of the ground material and all of that. that. And then uh, you go out and you hire your authors, and, and they do the best to, to, to focus in on on this specific adventure bring their own voice voice and ideas but and then then once they come in it comes back to uh the the developer who then has to go through and kind of stitch everything everything together while kind of juggling this maintain the author's voice and and personality but also making it feel like the whole thing is one one whole tricky it's a it's a tricky thing to yeah, well, you guys did an amazing job at it, and that's right. I mean, there's over. I mean, can, can, that's all that they do. Can you believe that after 15 years of Paizo selling thousands and thousands of copies, the reprint selling thousands of copies? I mean, the you know the, the, the Savage Worlds fans are already over a thousand backers who want to play in this world. Um, the longevity is really amazing. So that, that's really a testament to the job you guys did there. Yay! Hey. Right, it's good. So um, yeah, we you know, we already had a little spoiler. I mean, you know the. We know the queen's bad, but there are some mm-hmm. great, you know, uh, intermediate characters who really shine um, and are not. I mean, there's some some big, big. Uh, so here, here's a spoiler for one of the midway kind of kind of guys. But this is a great question. Um, did the background history of mm. Castle Scarwall, which is one of the most interesting kind of locations you end up going, um, come before the adventure or was it devised later during the course of kind of constructing the adventure path? Because it's very, it's very deep and very in-depth. I mean, it doesn't feel like it's, it's a filler kind of thing. It feels like it's got its own years of history into it. Um, and, you know, yeah, the, the person that's got Kazavan, who's also a <clears throat> and their rise to power and, the, <clears throat> and then the death. And then they're like bound and scattered. And oh, there's another soul that gets bound to the cat. I mean, there's all this really great stuff. And then it kind of becomes this font for <clears throat> spoilers. So the um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, a, it's a very enigmatic, a very interesting kind of kind of location. So um, tell us how that came about. Uh, it's, it's all kind of happens at the, at the same time. Um, when we're com- coming up with the original idea, the, the, the very, very, very first, uh, I guess, inspiration for, for Curse and Throne going all the way back was a, a West and I went to see a movie in, in, in called uh, uh, Curse Golden Flower. Flower. And uh, it's this martial arts epic, and it's just super vibrant and colorful. And we were really, really just delighted with just how these big elements were, were having. And uh, we, uh, we wanted something like that with this adventure path, path. something that was more like kind of urban, urban political. And, and uh, 
Um, new, we also wanted to uh, challenge ourselves, like, like let's have, uh, again, again, spoilers, let's have the main, main villain of the Venture Path be a bard. What time was, was one of these classes that all people like, the bard is, is used, used, meh. It's my favorite, favorite character class. I, I also enjoyed the challenge of making the bard the, the main villain of the Venture Path. Um, but it's a, it's a six part, first to 20th level, level art at the time, to 17th or 18th level Adventure Path. path. So you know more than one storyline, you know all this different, different stuff. And, and um, at the time we were just, just starting out uh, Galarian. We, this is only our second Adventure Path. We, we, we really, as much as make, making an entire series, we were inventing, putting pronouns and, and villains that would, would things out beyond the storyline line. And uh, we, did, we didn't really have a villainous dragon in our, our uh, legacy yet. It's something that uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons has a lot of, um, and so at a point when we were kind of kind of going off and doing our own, we were really really conscious of trying to do our do something different that hasn't wasn't really done in uh, D and D in particular. And, and there's element in in D and D dragons pretending to be humans or, or humans uh, turning into being into dragons, and we want, wanted to use that element in Curse of the Crimson Throne. Because it was a way to, to you know, make, make our established customers feel more comfortable. Like we're still doing the same stories you enjoy, and they're still familiar, but we're doing our own thing. So we wanted that, but um, we wanted our own spins. And so in Galarian, dragons don't necessarily really enjoy spending time in human form. And in this particular, is sort of meant to be to be a outlier to that. He's he's kind of. A strange case in that in that he enjoys a little bit bit too much pretending to be human, and um, by having Kazavon be sort of this this um, um, ancient evil evil I guess I, I would call him that that uh, enables the events of Cur Curse of the Crimson to start up. We introduce introduce kind of draconic element, but at the same same point, keep the, the focus on the Queen herself because she, she's basically using his magical body parts like his fangs in, in particular to empowers um so that's sort of like the genesis for casavon and as, as i note uh one of the things we were doing at this point at this point we we're coming so many many new, new names for for npcs for deities for regions for for monsters and, and all this stuff um we this is the i, I think the second or third time we time we use the word casavon for, for a character and uh, Wes and I, are, again, Wes and I were driving driving off to Seattle at some point to probably see some other, mo other movie. And all of a sudden, whoa, wait a minute. We already have, already have a River Nazavon. Oh, so, so if, you, if you pay attention, you'll see there's Kazavon River in Barissia. And the retcon of that is like, yeah, it's of course named, named after this famous scary blue, dra blue dragon. It was totally not an accident. I mean, retcon aside, it's fantastic. I mean, that's, that's real world stuff, right? The, uh, yeah, it's true. Name came from the river. Yeah, it's weird, weird in fiction, be it like a novel or a game or something like that. If you use the same name, name for two different characters, it's, it's a mistake. Whereas That's true. There's, there's, in Epizo, we've got two or three Jameses. So it's, it's like, it's a, you can't right, really do that, fiction. That's why I go by Landauer, because there are very much fewer Landauers than there are Christophers. And there yes. are Christophers everywhere. So the, uh, yeah, especially like local clubs, you have like you know, three or four in the local club and it's, it's a gaming club. And it's like, yeah, I. <laughs> I'll just be Landauer because the you know, since it's Chris and like seven people turn around. Yep. The um, but we yeah, I mean, luckily we, we got got the uh, the question the original question and the you know, favorite NPC which is uh, um, uh, fortuitous. The let's see on the our next big comment. Um, let's see. Uh, here, here's one we'll throw in right now. Um, are there plans for other adventure paths? So uh, if it's for Savage Worlds, if that's for us, um, yeah, guys, you guys have shown such wonderful support for our original Kickstarter, and this one's going fantastic. So um, I think we will keep keep making path, Savage Pathfinder as long as you guys keep embracing it. Um, and then for um, you, James, the uh, I mean, I, I, I think that you guys haven't stopped. I mean, I looked at your mm -hmm. production schedule, and it's you know it's been 20 years of adventure paths. So it's I mean it's true. Right now, oh. Uh like I said, we, we, we plan this out pretty, pretty far in advance. I'm currently work, working on Adventure Path that will be coming out uh, next year that hasn't been annou announced yet. And then and then another one hasn't been announced yet. And then another one that I'm going to be writing for that hasn't been announced yet. Um, yeah, we're coming up on volume 200. So, so it's wow. it's pretty amazing. 
The um, I mean, at our pace, um, we will all be old and retired and playing in our retirement home before um, uh, Savage Worlds catches up with the 20 years history. Because I mean, I was looking at your, your the original release schedule. We we're talking about a little bit on the pre-stream. You guys were putting out one of these books a month um, mm -hmm. initially. And, um, and obviously, you know, there's probably a year more behind the development before it's announced and see it's getting put out. But that's a that's a, a brisk schedule. Mm -hmm. And um, especially seeing that, you know, even, you know, even us doing the conversion, um, it's been a year to do the six books of Rise of the Rune Lords. And um, hopefully it won't be another year for Curse of the Crimson Throne. We're hoping it's only like six months. Um, yeah. But the uh, I mean, it's great material and it's so well loved. So um Let's get to the next question. The oh, here's one to make you feel bad. Yeah, yeah. I won't tell you who asked. Oh, <laughs> does anyone ever feel a bit sad about making a poor little innocent girl the first person to contract the plague in the first adventure book? Um, <laughs> not really. I mean, I, that may, may make me a person, but I mean, it's it's emotional manipulation. You know, it's a case where you you want to get your characters invested in following the storyline and. and the class of doing that is like, is like go do this and, and this guy will pay you money. And that kind of motivation gets sold pretty quickly. The more, the more you, the more you play, the play, the more you game. And, and having a case where it's like, um, this young kid, uh, adorable little girl, little girl is this horrible disease. That's a pretty compelling reason to go on the adventure where you have to fight, fight the disease. Interesting. Um, if we were doing this adventure today, we, we do it differently because, because, um, you know, children peril is, is pretty, pretty triggering, something that we need to, to handle really maturely and responsibly. And also a case where, I mean, just looking back, back at the time, a lot of people people saying they can't do a play, a play adventure in a game because there's removed disease. Removed disease. People, people will just get rid of it immediately. And we, and we had to do a lot of justification, you know, about how that can still happen in a fantasy thing. And now we're in the middle of a global pandemic where it's like, this sort of thing, it, it, it doesn't matter if you're technological or magical or something, it'll outrip your capabilities. So it's it's definitely definitely a, kind of a, a spooky sort of um, plot line, you know, in retrospect today is, is it's like, at the same point, it's, it's cathartic to be able to step in and actually be heroic and change the, the course of uh, these events, events too, so. Oh, that's, that's a great point. I, I really do think that that is what one of the, the best things about RPGs is. I mean, it does allow us to, I mean, it allows us to process very complex issues yeah. in a space that is more safe to experiment and um, and e even just to you know, vent a little bit, um, you know, explore fantasies in multiple kind of ways. And yeah, I, all the topics here are as relevant today or more so than they were 15 yeah. years ago. Um, and it's cra it's crazy how I mean I think just you know looking at how the world and how individual people would have responded to a plague and I I, I you know, the a lot of the medieval you know set things deal with plague because that was a big thing during our own you know medieval mm -hmm. history but you know none of us really remembered you know the like the 1919 influenza plague but now now we all have some real hands on experience yep, with yep. what that means even in a very modern world with I mean we know about the concept of, of infectious disease and about microbes. And then they, they really didn't uh, back then. And now, you know, we know about washing your hands and all the wonderful, wonderful things you can do. And it's, you still see how, how crazy the world is. And just mm -hmm. how, you know, even just like the, the ennui of a, of a yep. pandemic. And so it does feel good to be able to go be a hero, go out there and, and you know, fix it, solve it. Let's do this. Let's be absolutely. Let's find some resolution besides, oh, it's gone from a pandemic to endemic. Yay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so next question: um, Any rhyme or rhythm for which characters in the adventure path are redeemable in the book? This is a good one. Um, yeah, because I mean that's a, one of the other interesting things that I think Piso did. Besides, you know, not just focus on like the D and D dragons. Is there there really was even at the early these early adventures um, characters who were evil? Absolutely, but there were characters that you could redeem or help redeem or steer you know steer towards goodness. Um, with your player actions. So uh, several of have tried to backstory and during the campaign, players are able to bring them over to the good side with their player actions. Any specific reasons on which ones were picked? Um, or is there any other kind of, what, what's the design theory behind um, the, the, the ones you can turn good and the ones you can't? Um, I, I, it really, to a certain extent, it's to the author, there, but it's all thing that uh, uh, myself and several other, several other Paizo, we really want to encourage. Um, there's one element where you just go in and kill the monsters and take all their all their stuff, and you know that, that can be very 
a cathartic therapeutic you know just just escape from from reality the more the more into like role playing and and building worlds uh, uh having somebody just be just be evil evil sake Jake just competitive and dull and and so we try to make uh, uh villains you know you know make sense why, why they're villains, even if it's even if it's a case where they're just they happen to enjoy being evil um, um as for deciding which which ones are worth redeeming and which ones aren't um We'll pick a few, a few of them. We'll like, you know, depending on the themes from of the adventure path, uh, focusing on some that maybe be aren't quite as fully in on the the evil train others. Um, but at the same same point, we never know which characters will resonate with which particular group. So we try to just make sure that sure that all of our NPCs uh, note have strong backstories, and and uh, that might might. Uh, Result, result in some, you know, you know, people saying you spent a half a page talking about this goblin's backstory that n nobody will ever know. Other group might really have a value in that, and that, and and you have reason to to like, you know, redeem him or recruit him or, or something like that. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. The, um, I mean, I, I I particularly like that. I mean, I I do like that. There is, you know, you can't solve every problem, so there there are characters that are just irredeemable, and mm -hmm. the players have to figure out how to solve that. And but then there are characters that you can actually leave a lasting legacy on, um, you know, bring it over the good side. So I think that's that's kind of the best of both worlds there. Yeah. Um, let's see the oh so here's the thing so minor spoiler but the at one point if you want the help of a certain very powerful barbarian group to to help you you know solve some of the world problems you have to demonstrate your good faith by doing um, a challenge. And there are several different ways you can do these challenges. And so the question is, what is your favorite challenge for getting the Shawanti's approval? Uh, the person who submitted the question, their favorite is letting the giant purple worm that is fused to the plane of fire swallow you whole with no armor, and then you have to escape alive. Um, wow, these, these aren't like, these aren't, aren't small challenges. This no. Like it's a, a pretty big thing. So do you have a favorite besides the giant purple worm? I do. I, I really like... The idea was you have to do these these kind of kind of quests of Hercules type things. And uh, just going out and fight, fighting things, that's... You've already been doing that, that for three, three and a half adventures. So we wanted them to feel, feel not, only, not only unique, but things that you can't do if you're low level. You're, by this point, you're, working, you're, you're getting high level. I think one of my favorites is, is probably trying to keep it from too spoilerific again. There, there's uh, a trail of totem where you have to start. You basically have to build a battleground that you then have to fight fight in. And uh, it's a fun combination of showing off your strength, showing off, showing off your wits, showing off your, your combat stuff. That That is fantastic. The um, So uh, here's another good question. Um, what challenges did your team find in creating the chapters in which the events were meant to be fluid, which like allowing the players to jump around in time and uh, events that didn't have to be confronted in a particular order? Um, obviously, like you know, future events could happen and you kind of circle back. So um, how did you go about creating these chapters? And you kind of mentioned a little bit about this before, about mm -hmm. the, the amazing kind of um, thousands of thousands, tens of thousands of word outlines. Yeah. Um, but, you know, is this an outline thing? Is this a flowchart thing? How do you go about creating, um, allowing players to... You know, pick and choose a little more organically, a little mm -hmm. less railroady, but still, you know, this is overall a kind of a, a directional train where we're headed somewhere. So yeah, um, that, that's you. We use all, all all the different tools. Sometimes we'll use flow charts. Sometimes we'll use just just extensive outlining stuff. Um, and then we we also have to to present these in you know you know a linear fashion because that's how how length works. So it's it's kind of it's kind of a everything kind of firing at once, and we just just try to like. Well, if we present them in this this order, they will make most sense to, to in a, a narrative flow when you're reader reading through the year. and so, and so when you're first encountering all of the, all of this when you read through it, we want want them to make sense, and then we use headings and uh, organizational uh, tricks to get easier to navigate uh, once you start playing the adventure. Um, it's it's tr it's tr uh, for, for inside of you know dungeons and all that, all that I mean, dungeon itself, itself is, is basically a visual visual outline with all of the hallways and rooms representing the choices and, and event event. So um, that's that's why we lean in on the dungeon building side of things because those are the the most efficient way to way to present this this sort of interactive environment where players can choose which directions as they go through an area. It's something that for Kingmaker we really, really uh, did a lot of more work with uh, presenting, presenting a lot of these encounters 
where you could go any direction and you know turn left and you fight a kobold you right you fight six holes and uh you just gotta it, it puts a lot of extra work on the gm of course as well they gotta really know what's what's ahead it's coming and be think, kind of like pivot pivot oh no I, I think kingmaker is the most requested next adventure path that we get um just because it is so I, mean, I really like how you guys made it sandboxy, allowing the players to create their own kingdoms, mm -hmm. but it is still woven directly into the myth and lore of Galarian and the challenges of Galarian, and and just kind of the idea of of like reseizing these these lands, these forbidden lands. I mean, it's it was a really clever idea on how to make it where you do get your place on the map and you yep. are a part of the global economy, um, but you do get a lot of freedom into can you create a functioning. Uh, hegemony here and yeah. um just yeah just a fantastic way of it in which um it's very unique i think i mean there aren't a lot of adventures that can do both right and mm -hmm. you know you, you you're coming off of i think what was, kingmaker was like fifth or sixth in the adventure past yeah um you know, so you've already got these you know several generations of characters you know of, of, of yep. people who you, if you've played them in order you've taken a character to max class several times um, and so now you really get to kind of flex, you know, you, you, you know, about several different regions on, on the map, but now you really get to claim one for your own. Yep. And, um, that one's exciting. So I, I, I'll put in a good, my vote doesn't count for anything, but I put a vote in like for the next one, for the next Kickstarter for Pathfinder. I hope it's Kingmaker, but I'm, I hope we get, I, I definitely hope we get there because it is, it is a very, um, it's one of the, what's one of the, definitely one of the ones that we, we, um, we just finished our own enormous, uh, update to second edition for it. And uh, it's, it's it's on the boat boat coming over as far as I know. It's 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 something I've been working on basically the entire length of the pandemic. I've been been working on uh, the Kingmaker conversion. So it's oh, it, it's fantastic. a fun one. But, but so yeah, Pathfinders, keep your eyes out for Kingmaker Second Edition because yeah. um, we we all know the global the, the suffering of trying to mm. get a container and trying to get information on where the container is and then being very thankful it's landed on u.s soil but then also like i mean like la they're they're they're, they're robbing container like you know off of the trains that get yeah. into our distribution centers and it's like please don't steal our books they're very we want to have fun with them and they're very nice yeah, yeah. um so yeah, yes yeah. so hopefully kingmaker arrives safe and sound and you guys fingers are crossed okay. right fingers crossed knock on wood the yeah. um yeah, I want wood because that'll turn my computer off or something like that. That's right. If you bang too hard, your camera goes out. So yeah, we, we do apologize <laughs> about the gremlins. I think we got a little bandwidth issue, but um, you know, sorry, Pacific Northwest. We want all the bandwidth from James because um, <laughs> this is great stuff. So here's a really quick, easy, short one. Um, was the vigilante class, and I think one of the uh, that might actually be a vigilante right there in the picture. Um, was the yeah, that's actually the black track, Yeah. Right, uh, inspired by Blackjack, uh, the chaotic good hero of the downtrodden of Corvosa, um, and in turn was Blackjack inspired by Zorro. Um, uh, Zorro was in there. Uh, so was Batman, obviously. Um, um, the author of the original that Adventure Path, uh, Nick Nick Logue, uh, is just a huge fan of just all sorts all sorts of these type stories where there's, there's basically a folk hero. Um, Vigilante class uh, was partially inspired by, him, but it's really at that point in first edition, first edition we were like, other kind of characters can't can't you be in Pathfinder that don't ask yet. And the idea idea of like, uh, the 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 kid with the secret identity who is basically Batman, um, where you're a bard by day and a fighter fighter by night, thing like that, as was main inspiration for for uh, the vigilant class. And and then having Jack be already in the game. Along with other characters like the Red Raven, um, just more ap appropriate. That's tricky, weird elements of building a new class for Path Path is that we want it to be something that's, that's fun to play, but we also want, want it to be something that has already existed in the world. Because if you make up a brand brand new character class, class there's no you know anchor in the lore. It feels like tacked on, and, and so something like uh, in Second Edition we added, a, a, for example, the Inventor. Um, that, that's not so, there's, there's obviously inventors in those in the world before we did that class. Uh, same with like, like witches. And, uh, that was one of the reasons the summoner kind of a little bit at odds originally, because we didn't really have a role for them pre summoner class class. We've got plenty of them, of them now, but it's tricky. Anyway, no. that's kind of a wandering answer to that question. Oh, question. no, it's a perfect answer because, um, so yeah, for those of you who are joining us, if you are a um, Savage Worlds player, 
We are converting um, Pathfinder Adventure Paths to the Savage Worlds rule system. We have our second Kickstarter up now on Kickstarter. It's the Curse of the Crimson Throne and the Advanced Players Guide. And in the Advanced Players Guide is, are some of the classes you just mentioned. There's the Witch and the Summoner and the Inquisitor. And yeah. the um, yeah, the Summoner, I mean, people really love the Summoner. Um, I, I like to think of it as like the, the people who really like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! but wanted to yes, play yes. as the animals. You want to be the beast, right? Like that is is more interesting as it, for a development and the way you can upgrade your, your Eidolon, which is what they call you know, your, your big summon, and, and just how you share things with, between your characters really allows for that kind of ethos. Yeah, it, it's really the summer gives player, players who want to play monsters a chance to play monsters. It's, it's, a, tr it's a tricky thing to off otherwise because... I mean, writing adventures and games uh, like this, this you kind of have to make assumptions. It's like we're making treasure, treasure, magic boots. So you have to kind of assume every player character has feet that they can wear those boots. And doors have doorknobs. So you have to assume they have hands. It's, once you start getting really unusual player character uh, uh, ancestors, it, 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 it starts buckling, buckling the, the core assumptions of the game. So, uh, But with something like the, the Summoner, you got your more standard, you know, player character, but you've also got this just wild monster monsters that can uh, play with each other. Um, like, I guess how the druid, druid work, but you're not just limited to animals. So, so. The, uh, that is perfect. So I, I suspect this is a question that got snuck in by our um, commander in chief, Shane Hensley. <laughs> it says, it's come to my attention that you are particularly fond of Ovo Novo, a demon lord who is a ship sized shark, who is also able to take the shape of a human. Um, I suspect Shane might have this ability. Um, our fearless leader, Shane Hensley, is also a preternatural interest in sharks. Is this a requirement for truly great game design? The uh, timing, you got a shark picture right there, the jigsaw, jigsaw shark uh, down. Uh, um, it doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt. Uh, sharks are pretty awesome. I mean, does kind of cement them as as gestures for the rest of time. Time and uh, I mean, I grew up. My my father was a commercial fisherman, so I I had plenty of shark escapades of my own. Um, um, so Ovo Novo is a, is, is a monster that I, but I made that name up, name up like back as a kid. It's like, there's, there's be a, a scary name for something. And I like, like the idea that it's a palindrome. You can spin, spill up both directions. And, um, yeah, it's just sort of a, a critter that, that skinned the back door when I, when I was working, I think back, back on one of the books and I, I just did a spooky name for something and we didn't have a demon shark shark in the game yet. So. Just kind of lucked out, but I, I just, I just really like the idea of just sharks are are frightening and demons demons are frightening. When you combine them together, it's just like, like strapping a fling a fling to a nuclear bomb. <laughs> that is fantastic. Yes, the um, so we've got a question from the Paizo stream. Um, the Thunderbird 101 asks. Uh, Hey, James, uh, when you run Pathfinder, uh, Curse of the Crimson Throne specifically, but it could be more general, um, do you ban or restrict any PC options? So how do you keep PCs in line when you run these games? Um, I generally try, try not to ban options and uh, keep it open as possible because I want the players to be, be excited about playing the character to play. Um, what I'll usually do for game for game I run, create something something similar to the adventure, adventure of Path Guides that we put out where it's like, if you play in this game, game you should probably consider, consider this, you know, class or this alignment or this, you know, this religion or this uh, ancestry. Because if you choose thing that's out outlandish, chances are, you know, you might end up playing a character that just does, just doesn't fit. So I'll work with players, try to guide their choices, and uh, work with what they want to do, and uh, do a, uh, I guess a a consensus where they get to choose the stuff that they, they want to do, but in a way that still still fits in the theme of the storyline I want to tell. Um, um, so, so I usually, and I don't, don't, I try not to ban stuff because if a player is excited about something, that's, that's, that's to me, they're going to be more, more excited to play. They're going to be able to play the character, the character. Uh, there's some stuff that I'm not a personal, personal fan of. I, I also kind of see that as a challenge, challenge to myself. Like I want to, I don't be, I'm not a fan of dwarves, but I love when pe people play dwarves in ga games I play. I want to see what makes them so excited about dwarves and, and, and uh, just broaden my my horizons too. So. Oh, that's fantastic. The um, I, I, I love that. I like that outlook. I mean, the I, I think there are certain things in, in, in fantasy that, that individuals are more attracted to and, and, and get the creative spark to. Um, but I, I, I love the fact that the even the things you don't like, you're keeping an eye out for how people can might make those more interesting and, and, yeah. um, and relevant. That's fantastic. The um, also at Paizo Watcher on this one, 
I will hopefully not put your name. La 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 Lulu Lama uh, asks, are there any characters, <laughs> artworks, etc., cetera, um, visually inspired by Paizo employees? I know other companies like Wizards of the Coast comes to mind will often hide their staff members like that as Easter eggs. And I was wondering if Paizo does the same. We've uh, um, uh, now, now and then put character player characters that we've played. I've done that a couple of times. Uh, it's not, it's, it's kind of fallen out lately. Um, um, but actually, actually putting Paizo's staffers into the not not intentionally. We our our arts are uh, they're from all all the world, and we publish so much of it, of it that uh, it's really uh, it, it can be tricky tricky sort of thing. Uh, now and then, I think, think at least once um, we've had a, a art sneak in one of our art directors as a character, just because they kind of know each, know each other and they enjoy enjoy that, but. It's, it's something that we haven't really done a lot of, as far, far as I know. Um, um, there's certainly a couple of cases cases where, you know, you know a piece of art will come in and it will look similar to, to somebody, uh, be, uh, be either somebody at Paizo or, or uh, a famous actor or something like that. And try to avoid those just because it can break very break, break similar if, if like somebody looks just like Johnny Depp showing up in an adventure. Um, uh, it, 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 not really. Nah. I guess I guess this is, this is a slow this the the, the general version of that, that I can think of actually. Well, perfect. The um, uh, let's see. Here's a question from one of uh, Peg's uh, all-time longest watchers of our stream, from John Doom. In the process of writing and editing an adventure path, is there any section that you still find yourself particularly proud of? Oh, geez. Um, getting it, getting it finished uh, is is always high on that list. Um, but one thing that I'm actually proud of with curse the, the crimson throne is that uh, like i mentioned earlier earlier we got a bard in in there as the this really frightening scary intense villain and uh up until this point all of the big bad end villains of our adventure venture paths were either um demons or gods or evil wizards and um it was fun to get to a point where it's like we, we don't have to, this is just a this is the evil queen and it's it's a story storylines old as the older as old as time uh showing off that e that even the class that people made fun of the fun of the most the the big, biggest villain in game was 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 something i was edited by the uh no i, I mean uh, but yeah but right people sleep on bards or or they only characterize bards as like very like like lotharios and it's like mm -hmm. there's more to them bards than seduction guys there's oh, yeah. other ways and um you know i i think it'd be fun to run a fantasy campaign where it's like they're all a heavy metal rock band so they're all oh bards, yeah oh, yeah. You know, oh right? absolutely absolutely I, that's something i've kind of been itching to do for a long time as an adventure venture but everybody is the same same class or everybody worships the same d something like that but but you, those are tricky to pull off because you want each one of these adventure paths to, to appeal to as many people as possible. And uh, yeah, we do it now. Like uh, uh, Skulls and Skulls was, uh, you have to play pirates. Um, always get people like, well, I, I'm going to play Paladin Odin's in the pirate venture. So. But <laughs> right. they still, I mean, they, they still buy the adventure. We still get, get them. <laughs> It was fun during yesterday's stream. The one of the items that we are, are uh, we have converted in the advanced players guide is actually like the Buccaneers Cutlass, which or the the shirt, uh, which allows you to not drown. It, it swiftly raises you towards the water if you're underwater. Yep. And I was like, this is such a good thing for a pirate game, especially if only one person on the crew has one. <laughs> and just just <laughs> watching watching the struggle with you. Know, of course, of course, the Leviathan is going to turn your ship over and you're all going to fall into the water. How many of you really took swimming, really? The, um, the uh, so so you mentioned that the um, that, that the the uh, Kingmaker was on its way um, over for the the Pathfinder Second Edition. The uh, what's any other upcoming things that you can announce that are coming out for Pathfinder Second Edition right now? Um, we've got got uh, the Abomination Vault is, is another uh, compilation we've, we've uh, done recently. Uh, that one's I think out now. Now it's it's kind of it's all blurs together when something thing shows up in the browser when it's it's actually in a store. Um, um, I'm on the edge of being able to, to talk about this next next adventure I'm working on, but I think with Encon being so close, we're really kind of playing those cards close to the vest at this point as to what what we're revealing, what we're not. not. But it's something that that. Um, I don't want to say that if people look at the at the background, my office here, they clues, but 
is only the books that I might have out might be, be more appropriate for whatever, whatever I'm working on right now. Right, so, so now everyone's like, what are the books? <laughs> what are the books? Which ones does he have out? I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> the, um, yeah, we do the same. We, we put little little tidbits in the background, some little miniatures on games we're working on. And the um, it, it's fun. But yes, we will not make you spoil before Gen Con because then the uh, the other powers of be a Paizo might be a little mad at us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Right, so, so you got to wait. So show up at Gen Con, people. We are having live conventions once again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah and Ray, for <laughs> allowing us to have um, live conventions again. So the um, here's a, uh, a question. Let's see. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, so Dave Gunsinger asks, Curse of the Crimson Throne begins as essentially a revenge tale, but soon expands well beyond that. I love that it begins with the PCs wanting to avenge something up close and personal, but quickly puts the fate of the city on their shoulders. Watching that evolution is an awesome thing to behold at the game table. Uh, and I, I, I do believe Dave Gunslinger is currently running a uh, Curse of the Crimson Throne actual play. Mm-hmm. So you guys can tune in. Feel free to put your schedule in the chat, Dave Gunslinger, and we'll let people know when they can catch your um, location and stream for uh, your actual play. And the, the crazy thing there is that this is before um, we even released Curse of the Crimson Throne. He's already converted to Savage Pathfinder. <laughs> so we have nice. a very excited... Um, the, uh, we, we, we are but few, but we are mighty in our enthusiasm for our, our fans. So um, a lot of the questions kind of came in from like the RPG design group on Reddit. So quick question on kind of just overall, like the industry. Um, what, what are your opinions on like your favorite role from author to editor in chief to creative director? The, um, how, how, how does that, how's your evolution of, of, of looking at RPGs and playing and running them changed um, as you have worked your way to the literal pinnacle uh, of the industry. Um, you t- tell us about some of your, your, your path there. So, um, it's, it's, in- it's interesting that part that I, that I've uh, worked behind, behind scenes, you know, building, building adventures and all of this stuff, the more I've realized it's a game that has so, so many different people that want to want to play different ways. You know, if you're back in college, I, I built, I built an entire pain setting, setting, uh, to, to run for, for my friends and was pretty pretty much tailored to my inter- interest in theirs, and it was it was it was fun. A lot of that has actually actually been uh, uh, kind of transitioned into into uh, Grand. But the more that I uh, you know work on Galarian and, and actually see these these adventures go out of the world and see feedback from other people, it's it's really it's, it's exciting to see how many different I guess. Uh, uh, points that different players come into the game from, you know, like some people have different, like I was saying earlier, early, I, I'm not a fan of dwarves, dwarves, but seeing other people really get into, into dwarves, it's, it's exciting to see stuff enjoyed in different ways, I guess, and, it, and it's I, I, I take it as a kind of a personal challenge, challenge, try to make sure that all of the games we, games we publish are wel- welcoming, inspiring, during to as many people as possible, possible. and um, uh, it's, it's, it's it's tricky, um it's definitely, I mean, I see a lot of uh, cases where, where, you know, especially like the internet, somebody will say, nobody likes this or everybody hates that. It's like, not necessarily true. Like your group or even in every place in your city might have, have that opinion, but on a scope of things, things, it's not necessarily the case. And having a more open mind to different type, type stories and different ways of playing the game is really, really, it helps make you have more fun with the game. I mean, that's also one of the things too, is that the, the longer you you work in the end, the more it becomes. You have to try to push against it becoming just work and not fun. Important to still play the game, and seeing other people interpret these games in different ways. Ways is ways that um, even when I if I if I don't have the time to play games all the time, I can, can still be like, oh, I never thought ever thought of doing this, or I never thought of approaching it from, it from an angle. Uh, it's it's constantly uh, inspiring, I guess. It refuels the imagine, imagination tank. Oh, that's fantastic. So here's here's one question. There are two questions we ask everybody who comes on stream. So how did you first get into gaming? Oh, no. And then um, obviously it sounds like you've been with Pathfinder since almost the beginning. So uh, how did you get into Pathfinder? Um, so those are the, those are the, the two big ones. Oh right. So so I'll keep this relatively short. It was back back in the early '80s, 80, 83. I was in fifth grade, and my fifth grade t- teacher. Uh, d- decided to split the the entire class into a few different groups, and he would run, would run them through his Dungeons and Dragons uh, adventure that he he had using the blue the blue uh, way back back in the early days. And the trick was he would would run run us through an encounter, and then somebody in that group had to write that encounter encounter up a short story, 
and turn to the teacher as like bonus extra credit for English. And then, then once that was turned in, we'd get to the next encounter and the next encounter. And I even back then in fifth grade, I was super into, into writing. So I kind of gave my group an advantage because I, I always wrote things up super fast. And so we we ended up getting into this adventure venture immediately. But at the same, at the same time, you know, he also sort of rented us. Just, he would run these encounters during lunch breaks and all that. And it was sort of a, a team building, I guess, back back in, in, in fifth grade, uh, fostering friendships and, and uh, just role playing and all that. that. Um, encouraging you know, just like to keep track of managed resources and math and all that he this was an amazing job using the game as game as a teaching i guess uh but at the same point the game just kind of like what what you play a, an elf and throw fireballs at giant lizards and and that was pretty much it yeah i just started playing after that was my my, my gaming group gaming group for my family um got to high school and, and found other players to play with and eventually uh 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 he launched a uh, dungeon magazine. It's like this magazine is just filled with adventures. I'm gonna start submitting adventures, and I'm sending letters and sending letters. And I got got uh, I got one published back. When I was about four, about 14, 15 old back in dungeon issue number number twelve. And the real realization I could get paid to to do this uh, pretty much got its hooks its hooks in me. And from there, I ended up writing more more adventures and stuff like that. Eventually, I moved up to. Uh, from California to Washington, uh, in in theory, to work for was was just, and I ended up working at Wizards of the Coast for several years. Uh, then they spun off spun off their department in the Paizo, and a year later, I I kind of got headhunted out of Wizards of the Coast and over to to work for uh, Dungeon Magazine. So that's pretty much the the uh, way that went. There was a lot of, lot of patience, a lot a lot of you know um, luck, but uh, it, it worked worked. Wow, that's a fantastic uh, RPG creator origin story. Um, <laughs> we should all be so lucky. The, uh, but yeah, guys, I mean, you, you can start small and make it all the way to the top. So um, mm-hmm. learn like James. Just be good, be good at it because that's the other key. It's, that's the, well, the, mis- the mystique, right? Yeah, I've always said it's like, it's like you got to be passionate about it. Um, um, you got to be a great writer. But, but you have to supplement your writing with something else. For me, it's just it's a very deep interest in, in history and history and all that. But yeah. Um, uh, like Jason, Jason Bowman, writer, and he, he supplemented skills with ar- the architect and uh, uh, we had a Sean Reynolds. Sean Reynolds is uh, chemistry or uh, Bruce Cordell is. This, you are a great, great writer, and you have another skill. That's a great combination to to create world content. Um, and uh, be lucky. And honestly, honestly, it's I guess not so much so much in today, but being local really helps. Um, you know, be in, be in the area these games or games are being produced. You know. Uh, Wisconsin earlier, like the 80s, 80s, or you know, Washington, Seattle. There's a lot of uh, uh, gaming going on in there. Um, but I mean, now that you know we've got the internet going, it's it's. I think that being being local is kind of going away. You can make a splash anywhere, which is kind of cool. Right, and I, I think the other thing that I've noticed just you know, talking with other people in the industry is you have to treat it like a job, right? Like you have to mm-hmm. keep writing. You know, write, write, write. Do the work. Um, everyone's got some great ideas on on a setting they might like to do, or yes. you know, um, but you, you got to put out the work, right? Because you can't if you don't have a portfolio, you can't get hired on good ideas. You got to get yeah. hired on on proving, even if it's just sending stuff that you haven't uh, isn't published. Like yep. you know, yep. there, there there needs to be something there that people can read and and, and evaluate, and um, you know, just even just get your foot in the door. So do the work, right? Yeah, a- absolutely, moment. do the work. Work. Make sure you hit deadlines. Respect everybody. Everybody else. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's a fun industry, but it's a really small industry. industry. So if you do something like you, you constantly break de- deadline or you know, you know you bad med mouth uh, another em- employee, just some other some other person industry, you're like, wow, they're no good, blah blah blah. They'll get around, around. and uh, just make sure that that you are you know diligent to doing the work, that you're respectful of everything, everything else, and uh, in respect of of the game itself too. You know, I mean. Once you start like not enjoying the game, the game and treating it like a joke, uh, people can tell. Tell. That's true. I, the passion really does come through. I, I there, it's like there's no way to fake that. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and you know, I think almost everybody who who's built a career in gaming, which, you know, they don't they don't throw around like Hollywood money or movie money or game uh, like video game development money um, in RPGs. So you know, you have to the passion has to be there for you, right? Like you, you got to find yeah. your way in. So, and, 
and especially especially uh, recently recently know your work too i mean that's something thing that we on in my uh history is it's like i get to work on ga games that's that's all all i wanted and i i didn't really value the worth that i was bringing to the uh uh company that i was working for and uh knowing that you're bringing some, something to the industry uh whether it's like a, a, your skill or anything like, like that and not you know steer yourself i guess when somebody says i want you to do this uh, but I'll pay you an exposure or something like that. No, 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 no. You're providing. You're you're working. It's a job as a hobby, and make sure you know how to stick up for you. Just I, I just wanted to do a real quick uh, shout out to just all of the other other employees here who managed to get uh, the union going. Paizo, and uh, it's I think something that, and just how Paizo has accepted uh, uh, that new development and how everything is going is going is I think a really good sign sign of, of, of where things are going in the future sure. it's crazy how we are a really young industry i mean mm -hmm. the people who founded this industry um you know are, are just recently you know meeting their graves many of them are still alive mm -hmm. so i mean you know, we are we are that close to the founders and um you know, so it, it, it is exciting to see where this will go and and it's, it's weird to think that you know a, a generation ago this whole hobby didn't exist and now yeah. Um, you know, it's spawning. I mean, there's so much of, of what's in Hollywood now is, is just coming out of comics and RPGs. Yep. So it's just fantastic that we're getting the exposure we deserve. So oh, here's a very insider question from La 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 Lulu Lama. Is there any way that you can envision a star knife being an effective weapon in real life? If so, how would you wield it? So the knife is one of those weapons that comes comes from my homebrew campaign, and it's it's one of the things. It's one of the elements that kind of kind of just snuck in and kind kind of stuck, um, and it's now one of the core weapon weapons that just up in our books, and it's one one of the things I'm most delighted for for seeing there. Um, there's a movie called Crawl. Uh, Love Crawl. And remember, there's a there's a weapon in their glaive. That's a star knife. Star knife. Flip by a blade, and you and you throw it like that. Um, it's, it's been a tricky thing to get illustrated now and then. Then um, or a chakra isn't it? It's like throw like a frisbee. Um, they're not really meant to be boomerang, boomerangs. So once you throw them, throw them, you're gonna be on the receiving unless it's magic and you can whatever. But um, that's kind of the way way I've always in how they're thrown. Sometimes, like I was saying, the artwork they come across with big bulky blades, almost like uh, uh, spike shields, and that's sort of a case where it's like. It's a made-up weapon. It's hard hard to get it looking just right, especially in the early days when we didn't have the funds to illustrate everything. But but really, that's that's what I would say is go watch Crawl and watch how he throws that glaive around. I love the little bit, like the implied telekinesis power with it too. Yeah. You know, there's definitely parts where he's got his hand up and, you know, it's, it's, it's oh, there's resistance with the monster. And, oh, mm -hmm. God, love that. And then as a melee weapon, it's got that handle in the middle. So you're either stabbing with him with it or like jabbing with it or something like that. Um, um, or like uh, holding it. I don't know. It's, right. it's worst the, case the, scenario, you can like hawk the little big ruby in yeah. the middle of it to pay for some of your adventures. Yeah. Or like look it's at the great. way like Captain America or other people who fight with sheets, they can like, like bash with it just and stuff like that. Oh, it's a great weapon. So good question. Thank you that one. And then here's an interesting one. It's on, on kind of tone. Um, normal Shorshin fan uh, says, do you think there's still a place for darker, edgier villains, such as the Grawl family in published Adventure Paths, or is that something Paizo is moving away from? Um, it's something we're definitely moving away from. I mean, I mean that's the, uh, when we, we started, we were a very small company, and we were in the shadow of, of D&D, which was... was not doing a lot of these more mature topic stuff and by leaning into those edgier, edgier elements we that really helped us uh, establish ourselves as as something different than dungeons, dungeons and dragons even though we were still doing a a, a game span into universe where you know fight fight monsters their stuff um so we're moving somewhat away from that it's just a, it's a different world today too you know the, the game that published in 2007 is diff different than the game we're publishing in 2022. Um, but, but I mean, that's, we're still having some, some villains. I mean, this adventure that I just uh, wrote for uh, um, Pioneer Malevolence about a haunted house, there's some pretty grisly content in that, that leans into, you know, you know like um, domestic abuse and uh, a child, child abuse. Uh, it's, it's some really, really settling con concepts that uh, um, they're, they're still in the they're just not the the thing that we're trying to you know get attention with. I guess is what I'm saying. And and when we do, 
uh, uh, we are trying to make sure that there's, you know, content warnings and stuff like that. That's responsible. You know, you know, let players and, and readers, that if you want to play this game, there's this sort of spin there. So make, make sure everybody at your table is, 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 is fine with that content. So. Yeah, I think it's part of the the industry evolving too, and the fact that the there are just more stories that role playing games are able to tell. Yeah, and I, I know that you know some people think every story's been told, and there's no new ideas, but we it's a young industry, guys. I mean, there's <coughs> just you know fantasy is is certainly I, the most popular and always will be, but there's more out there. So there's like you know, let us tell you know unique new stories. There's the, the idea the idea that there's no new stories or is this. It, I, I disagree with that. I mean, there's certainly archetypes. That, I just started watching several on Apple TV last night. And on the one hand, it's, it's just sort of the same story you've, you've seen before, but the way they do it is just so compelling and interesting. Um, it's really one of the challenges I like is like, how do you take a story that is basically a haunted house and make it interesting? So, and uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, dark and edgy works as long as it works for the story. I mean, you can... Roger Ebert did a review of, of Dawn of the Dead in the day. He gave it four star stars. He said it was one of the best, the best movies there. Um, but it's also a super, super very violent movie. And uh, one of the things he said is said is you can um, have, have you can have a, gr have a grotesque without being grotesque. You don't have to be to be depressed. Talk about de depravity. And, and um, it's uh, something that, that I grew up in horror and my, my my grandma would give me like copies of Cujo when I was like eight years old. I was like, read this, this is good, good. And she was, was right, right. And um so horror has always been part of what I've really I've really been interested in. But but uh when I, I started at Paisa there was maybe, you know, 15, 10 people in the in the company. Oh, we're pu pushing a hundred there's a lot more uh employees here, a lot more ideas and, and, and personalities and and uh, that's i think good for the, the games we are getting more stories out there so but we're not pushing that much much more than we like you said we're still we're doing a lot but we're, we're still kind of limited to one ad adventure path a month and so we're telling other different types of stories and not so many so many of them are about gritty um ed edgy gritty art topics uh, they'll still happen happen now and then oh uh, best best way to just let us know that, you know that you're interested in um it's definitely not something that, uh, as as Pathfinder becomes more and more and more, you know, it's mass market. It, it it's something that it's a little bit trick trickier. It's I mean another element too, too. The industry you were saying it's 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 so much younger than than um, other industries that, uh, and, and since it's interactive, you put put yourself there. It's one thing to watch a horror movie like like it, uh, an evil clown is eating children, but it's something entirely different different to play somebody in that set setting. Um, so it's, it's a real sort of different element and we, and we don't control how it's presented to you. That comes through your, your game master. So, so I mean, game masters are, are great, but if you get somebody who's, who's, who doesn't care about, you know, you know, your sensibilities, they can ruin the entire experience for you. And, and, you know, players at the table table can be disrespectful. So it's, it's a really tricky thing that since it's so interactive, that strength of the game game and that makes it so much fun, but it's also, also kind of dangerous. So. No, it's very true, and it's also I think one of the big challenges of of doing like anything that's not strictly sandbox, right? And yes. I, I, I do hear sometimes people complain that oh, I want more sandbox, but then those are the exact same people when you sit down at the table to them and say, okay, here's a world. Did you read any of it? No. Nope. Um, what mm -hmm. do you want to do? I don't know. And it's like, guys, yeah, there is a there's a balance there. Even the people who complain about railroading stuff, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, we want we want to be able to tell a compelling story, and that means not everything can be done on the fly. And you know, we, we throw you into worlds where there are things in the world going on, and 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 you can't always swim against the tide. You know, yep. the, there there are things that happen, and so um, again, that is I think much credit to Paizo for being able to put together. Um, I think almost most or about all of your, your adventure paths are like six books, right? Yes. I mean, yes. That well, is... We're going to do three, four part ones here and there. Yeah. So, but still, but still multiple parts. And, 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 and so yeah, maybe, maybe like, you know, we're almost at our hour, but maybe talk about that for the last bit is, is what is it like assigning, but I think this is how it's done, right? Like, like each book has a primary author who's writing that, that book. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, there's oversight and editing and, and kind of vision. Um, what, what's it like? you know, making sure that, that you can, you know, book one hopefully ends off in a place that book two can pick it up and, and advance the ball with. I mean, that's, you know, it, it just sounds like a, a very 
uh, complicated but uh, juicy bit of, of creativity and and game design. So maybe just end with with that on on just kind of a, a little some what's some secret sauce on how Paizo does it because um, one thank you for letting us play it. Two we're yeah. jealous that you guys have done so well and it is just such, such greatness. It's, it's definitely something to aspire to um, in uh, kind of doing that balance. But how does Paizo do it? It's really, I, I think it's the, the development stage. You've got the design stage, stage, which is when you're writing something or designing it. And that's that's like the freelancer writes the adventure. And, and then on the other side, you've got the editing stage. And that's when an editor goes through, checks the, la the language, content, check, checks, you know, for, for um, uh, the, the, all of the different uh, ways, you know, you know, it can act with the world lore and canonical elements and stuff like that. Uh, but then, then in the middle, you've got a developer, and that that development stage is when you you um, step in and and kind of I've 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 all combined it, it uh, as said, like uh, you've you've designers and editors and the developer is multi class designer developer I guess this is one way to think about it. Um, and uh, that's really, really to me one of the more interesting parts is you take something that somebody somebody's written, then you 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 miss text and you add here and, and adjust content. They're trying to re retain their voice, uh, making it get segue into the next adventure just right. And um, I mean, in a, in a perfect world, we have one person person write an adventure path, and that that's well, we can't really do that because you know it would take take a long time for them to do it, do it, and then the product you know. Would have to would cost like two to three hundred dollars, and uh, it's yeah. it's easier to do these on I guess, I guess an install plan where you're spending twenty five bucks per per six parts rather than you know what hundred and fifty bucks for the entire thing all at once. All at once. Um, but uh, so yeah, that's 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 basically the, the, the trick is 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 being willing to go in and, and revise and and add content, but but being humble and respectful of full of the author time to make make sure that you. I guess, I guess overripe doing, um, it can be tricky. And then, you know, there's times when you can get an author who just can't finish the job on time or um, just, just in not being the right person for the job. And there's a lot more rewriting that has to happen at that point. There's been, been several years I've had to, had to basically rewrite from the, from, from script. And uh, in those cases, I have to decide if I want to, you, know, you know, share the author credit with them or give them the author credit and give them a lot of feedback. And, and um, it can be tricky, but yeah, it's fun. a complicated industry. So the uh, yeah, don't, don't take my my jokes as being dismissive of, of sandbox oh, yeah. players or biggest morals. Um, we love sandbox players. Um, they you know, at the at the more players can carry the burden of telling a story, the better in games. Uh, my my point is, it's very hard as a game master, and then even harder um, as a writer of RPGs to be able to like strike the right balance between giving story, giving beats, giving direction. And uh, but also allowing for sandbox, so that's I've, that's I've, my point. Don't worry, you because we're all, I'm not against yeah. sandboxing. I've, I've, I I prefer for sandbox play. I prefer giving, knowing what story I want I want to do, and then let players make the make the choice. But that's a really love the challenge, challenge ad libbing and, and ad hoc and and changing the plot, plot line as I go. And not every BM is is into that. Um, um, for me, it's it's. I mean, I've I've often said like it's an adventure path, not an adventure. Lots of different path. path. We have one basic story that we're telling. And if it's not something that your table table is going to enjoy, you know, you know, you wait three months and we'll do we'll do enough. For me, the true sandbox. We we did did stuff like, the, of course, with came came. A true sandbox would be some something like the camp setting books and books themselves. You know, something thing like like uh, uh, the the Lost Omens uh, Leds book we published published it presents like dozen different NPCs with all sorts of storylines, and then you as the GM get to decide what what you do what and where, where things go. So sandboxes take up a lot more room. They do. It's hard. They're more and, expensive. Uh, right, and every once in a while a raccoon comes and leaves you a present and you have to clean it out. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So one last question coming from the official Paizo. Um, Follow-up, is there any plan to port Demon Lords to second edition? Will Folka, will Folka still be around? And then they ask because he's such a fun villain to hate. That's that's a, a great example of something thing that, um, uh, I mentioned earlier where, you know, a movie like It, which, which is about an evil cl clown, uh, tricking kids into their dooms that's kind of what folk Folka's whole thing is um it doesn't work work for a, a game where you you know you might be playing in at in public at a, at a grocery store or something like that or, or the play, players might have like real world world um uh issues with uh, trauma and all of that you could be really respectful of that um 
the demon lords uh, are still around in the sun in the setting and all of this all of, the, all of that stuff is we publish it it's still there um we um, um are choosing which things we're doing uh sort of differently in second edition rather than than having like some, something like an entire book about one one topic we're doing sort of a of a um, rounded rounded i guess view view for it so like information from my, like beery uh uh is a demon lord lord demon lord ghouls and secrets held by the dead and he's got a lot of content in the upcoming blood lord lord's adventure path um so so all of that is still out there i mean i mean we now and then can choose who we want to tell stories about folk folk is a story not going to be telling telling stories i mean that's we've got we've got literally hundreds of, of demon demon lords and and monster that tell stories stories about and that one is one that um we should should not really put into the game it's it's just just it's not not a great subject to to have fun about you know child abuse, abuse is a real deep thing so. yeah well i mean right and no is always a good answer too i mean it's very rather yep. definitive and, and that's like i you know i do appreciate that pies i mean again you've given us so many hours I mean, yeah. almost a lifetime full of play. If you really want to go through all the material you guys have put out, it is a fantastic amount of material. So much of it is, is you know, just groundbreaking, and um, we love it. Thank you again for letting us play in your world. Yeah. The um, so again for folks who just happen to tune in, the um, we are at at, Pi, at Pinnacle. We are doing a Kickstarter right now. It is funded. Uh, One thousand and eighty-five backers have signed on already. There's two weeks to go from today. We're already at like one, two, three, four, five, six dollars, which is amazing. But we really do appreciate that more than a thousand backers. It is for the second adventure path we've released, and the, in turn, the second adventure path pies are released. We've already done Rise of the Rune Lords and the core Savage Pathfinder. So you can pick that up at peggink.com right now. In fact, there's a sale on it. I think it's 10% off the, the books. And then we've got a digital sale, so you can get all of the digital stuff and then come and back us digitally on the Kickstarter. Um, and then, um, yeah, the the path the Kickstarter is for Rise, uh, Curse of the Crimson Throne. And uh, James Jacobs, who has been uh, a wonderful guest and given us some really good insights on how Paizo thinks about creating these worlds, how they make them so wonderful, and um, how they're you know, listening to feedback and developing and, and even iterating. I mean, Curse of the Crimson Throne is a great one because there was the original 15 years ago, and then they made it even better six years ago. And so we've, we've taken the second one, and that's the one we're porting over to Savage Worlds. So it's been a blast. Thank you so much for letting us play Curse of the Crimson Throne uh, and, and you know, give it to the Savage Worlds audience. And then for all of our regular Savage Worlds folks, tomorrow we're going to have our Savage Summer Showcase where we'll be showing off all of the folks who are not Pinnacle who make Savage Worlds stuff. So it'll be our aces, those are our licensees, the swag creators, and our media network folks. Uh, we're going to kick that off uh, the first episode, but we'll be doing those all summer long. So check out the Kickstarter if you haven't. Um, wait patiently for the excellent news coming at Gen Con from Paizo. And um, the Kingmaker is on his ship, and it is close. Uh, we can't promise when it'll be in stores, but it's close. So uh, you can pick up Kingmaker for second edition soon. Um, and you can, uh, while you're picking up uh, Rise of the Rune Lords for Savage Worlds, uh, Savage Pathfinder, you can play them both. They're great. Um, the communities, we just love coming together with your community. So thanks again, James, for all you do. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you, everybody, for watching tonight. Yep, thank you. And thank you for bringing uh, Galarian to a uh, new audience.